And we're going to uh, give him a break from a long week at camp and everything. So I know that was always the test when you did a whole week of camp and then you came home on Saturday exhausted and you said, and I've got to preach tomorrow and everything. So he had a reprieve this morning and a reprieve, so give him his energy back. So, all right. It was late in the 1800s when a young man named Charles, or Carlo as he was called in his native country of Italy, was growing up in a home of working class people who had, according to his words, at one time been a fairly wealthy Italian family, but grew up always looking for an advantage if you will, and as he looked uh, for an advantage in life, he always looking for the next best thing, and he went through school and uh, got by on a a very talkative mouth and a uh, winsome smile and and, uh, was very cagey about what he did, but uh, he made it through and then went on and was going to study at university, but uh, talking wouldn't get him by there in that day and age. You actually had to study. And he didn't make it, but he tried a few things and failed, but he heard about some people who had had great opportunity in the New World, and in 1903, he sailed for America, arriving in Boston in 1903. He, with $2.50 in his pocket, he had lost the rest gambling, trying to make it quick there, on the boat, on the way over. Well, he got there and found some odd jobs and worked some odd jobs, and the next thing we know, he was in Montreal and working at a bank. Very dangerous thing for a young man who wants to get rich quick. And uh, after a couple years, he found out the banker himself was of the same ilk, and he was in trouble and uh, ended up spending three years in jail with this guy for check fraud. Next thing is, he was back in Boston and there got a job uh, doing some things with an investment house and everything and ended up uh, getting in trouble again, sneaking people into the country and immigration fraud and spent two more years in jail. But he was always looking for the next best thing. And the First World War came and it seemed that he had settled down a bit and almost found a job. But then after the war, he... At the end of the war, he met a girl in 1918, and uh, she fell in love with his smooth talking and, uh, and, and married him. And he settled down and got a job at his, uh, what was his uncle's uh, hardware store. But that soon failed after the war and the difficult times. And he heard about uh, some things that had happened after the war. There was... Um, Postal coupons that if you people didn't have much money, but if you wanted a response, what you, the world's postal system it has decided, well, you could send a postal coupon, and if you sent it to another country, um, they could redeem it in that country for postage to send a piece of mail back to America. Well, uh, with the inflation after the war and all the problems, there was he found there was about a little bit of difference between what you could buy them for and what you could sell them for. And so he made up a scheme where he told people he could make them 50% on their money in 45 days. If they gave him much money, he'd buy these coupons in one country and ship them back and redeem them and, and sell the stamps and make, make the money and everything. And people started coming and soon uh, he was raking in the money. And the money was coming in. In fact, the money was coming in so fast that he made up to $250,000 in one day in 1919, which is quite a bit of money. That's quite a bit of money. And he was making money. And the Boston papers got a hold of this. And all of a sudden, one day, the day after it hit an article in the paper, he had $3 million come in in one day. Well, there weren't enough postal coupons in the world to do this. 
And uh, of course, he wasn't doing that. By this time, he had got himself a chauffeured limousine, and he had got himself a nice big 12-room mansion in, in Lexington. You've heard of Lexington and Concord, uh, the American Revolution, and all kinds of fancy things and fancy cars. And this was within one year. He was, had all these things and a gold-tipped cane to walk with. He was, he was Mr. Community and Mr. Uh, Prestige in Boston. And he hired a biographer to write his biography. He already was so impressed with himself. But the biographer looked at it and said, there's something not quite right here. And he went to the newspaper and said, well, I don't think something quite right. And they did an investigation. They found it, and soon it all collapsed. Now, you'd know Charles, because Charles, because even today, his name is connected with this. His name was Charles Ponzi. Oh. And you've heard of a Ponzi scheme. You know what? The devil will lie to you if you're willing to believe it. The devil will take you in. He'll sift you as wheat. And as Christians, we need to realize that he is the liar and the father of lies. He is the founder of all this the founder of the Ponzi scheme, not Charles Ponzi. He's been lying, and he not only lies about this, but folks, he's the father of lies from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. He talked to Eve and convinced her that God wasn't true, but he was. And we as Christians, we've come from the world. We've come from out there. And we were taught to listen and that everything that the world said was right. I'm here to tell you tonight that everything that the world says is not right. In fact, most of what it says is not right. And I challenge you as a Christian to change your worldview and to let God be true and every man a liar. Every man a liar. Folks, even Paul acknowledged that when he said, search the scriptures. Don't believe me, search the scriptures. Even believing each other, only when we are founded upon God's word and God's truth are we true. And we need to not trust our flesh, because in this flesh dwelleth no good thing. We have the roots of the sin nature abiding there, folks, and we are tempted to deceive at every opportunity. And until the Spirit of Christ is dwelling in each one of us, we will continue to deceive and be deceived. Some of you are new Christians. I warn you, first of all, the world is going to lie to you and tell you, being a Christian has all these terrible things, and being with them is really good. That's a lie. That's what, <laughs> that's what Lucifer told Eve in the garden, all right? And that lie's been going on for a long time. The devil's a good liar. I mean, he, every once in a while, he'll tell you a truth. See, in the way the world gets by with it is they'll tell you a truth every once in a while. Because if they told you a lie all the time, you wouldn't believe them. But they tell you the truth, and they sneak it in every once in a while, so you'll follow them. Let's go to Colossians tonight and see. Paul was revealing the world that the Colossian, the Colossian church, the church at Colossae was living in. They were, the environment they were in was a harsh world. And these were new converts that had come out of the world and come out of heathen uh, ungodliness and false worship, worship of Diana and others. And they were being tempted on every side. And let's go down to verse 4. And he said, And this I say, lest any man should um, beguile you with enticing words. Sound like Mr. Ponzi? <laughs> okay, enticing words. For though he... Uh, um, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, 
enjoying and beholding your order and the uh, steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He, you know, he's looking at him and said, uh, I'm not there, but he said, I just admire your steadfastness in Christ because of the world that they were living in. They were standing for Christ, but he's admonishing them. He says, as ye have therefore received Christ, they're new Christians, the Lord Jesus, uh, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So how'd they receive Christ? By faith. They were supposed to walk that way. Rooted and built up in him and um, uh, established in the faith as ye have been taught, uh, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Let's pray. Father, I pray you just guide us tonight, Lord. Help us to learn of you tonight. Help us to learn how to stand. And having done all to stand, Lord, to stand in this wicked day, and Lord, that we would trust you and trust your word and put our faith in you, in faith in what you said. Lord, I pray that you would guide us and, and give us wisdom and understanding to know uh, and to discern good from evil and right from wrong. Lord, for truth and error, Lord, help us to see your truth. And Lord, what is right, Lord, and not the lies of the wicked one. Guide us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Not only were people like Charles Ponzi was around, but there were other deceivers that have come in the past. There was a couple guys in England, Arthur Smith, um, uh, and uh, a guy named Woodward in England. And um, they were uh, in an area of England called Piltdown. And Charles Smith said, I... He was a botanist or biologist and everything, and he was following the teachers of a theologian, a theologian named Charles Darwin, and was saying, I'm looking for that next great discovery. Well, he and uh, Mr. Woodward, who was at the British Museum, got together and uh, claimed to have discovered the missing link. But they had taken an old skull and put some mineral salts on it and made it look old and filed down the teeth to make them look worn and, and called it Piltdown Man. Later on, they were found to be deceivers, deceiving people. Folks, the world's going to tell you a lot of things. How do you know what's true? How do you know that you're standing on what is right. I know as a young preacher, I found that understanding and trying to tell people what is true, I came to a crossroad in my life because in my early Christian life, I had been handed uh, a New American Standard Bible and told me that this was the Bible I ought to use. And, and I went through Bible college, and there they, uh, quite a few of the guys were using a King James Bible. And I'd grown up in a very liberal home where we had a, a revised standard version. I call it the reverse standard version, and everything in a very liberal church. And I, and I began to realize, and then when I got saved, they gave me a good news for modern man. And I tell you, that thing is really weird. Okay, and uh, I had all these, and I was searching for the truth, though, because I knew that one day I would be standing, as a Bible college student, I'd be standing in front of people, and I'd have to say, and I wanted to say, thus saith the Lord, but how did I know what that was what God was saying? And so I went on a journey of about three years, searching and trying to find out, where did my Bible come from? Where was the truth? What, was there a truth? And folks, I challenge you in your life to search for truth. Now, I know we use the King James around here. Do you know why? You not only need to know to use the King James, you need to know why we use the King James. And I challenge you to study. I don't challenge you to do what I do. 
I want you to do what God says and to know with that. And so after a journey of several years, I started using the King James and God gave me a conviction on it because I searched the scriptures. I searched out where it was from and I found out that when I took that Bible, I felt in my heart and from study to know, he said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'd be ashamed if I stood up and said, thus saith the Lord, and I did not know that that's what the Lord said. We need to believe our Bible. You need to search the scriptures and know that what you're reading is from God. Why? Because your life depends upon it. Because you need truth. And he said, my word is truth. The truth of the Bible is essential to a Christian life. Because you're fighting not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You're fighting against a world who wants to take you down. And if you don't have a sharp sword in your hand, one that pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and to the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, the word of God will discern when someone else is trying to deceive you because it discerns their thoughts and intents. The word of God is quick and powerful. It's living. It's living. It's just alive, as alive today as it was when it was written. It's a living, and it's the living word of God, and you're going to need it. Why? Because we live in a day of deception. In fact, in the last days, the Bible, several times, I can't tell you exactly how many, I didn't count them. It says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. In the last days, deceivers shall come. Deception will come. The last days, the mark of the last days is a time of deception. And unless you know what God is, you're going to fall for a lie in the devil's Ponzi scheme. You're going to fall for a lie because he's going to promise you something that will sound too good to be true. And it is too good to be true. It's a lie. It's a lie. We are told to believe God and to walk by faith and to live by him. Go to Romans chapter 3, if you would. Romans chapter 3. There, in verse 4, it says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest uh, overcome when thou art judged. You know why you need to believe that God is true? Because that you might be justified in your sayings. So when you say something, it's not a repetition of the preacher's words, it's not a repetition of the world's words, but it's a repetition of God's words. Because it's God's truth. God is true. And God is right, and you need that as your defense. And why? Because that thou mightest overcome when thou art judged. You're going to be judged in this world. The world is going to come to you and say, oh, that's not true. You need to have the word of God that you might be justified when you're judged. See, it's the power that you have. You have, you have the dynamite in your hand right now. Why? It's the power to defend you. You need the Bible because it is your only defense. It is God's word because it is truth. It is that which will stand and will defeat the deceiver and all that he has. Uh, be not deceived by the world's measure. Um, men by nature are liars, and uh, they are liars, and the, the devil's the father of lies. And you are of your father the devil. Jesus told that to the Pharisees. He went over and over again. So who is he talking to? He's talking about the religious people. He wasn't even talking about the uh, unsaved or the reprobate down the street. He was talking about the religious people. And um, you are um, always need uh, to check with God to see that what you're saying is true. Your authority is the Lord himself. Lies, um, you know, there, there's liars around like Bernie Madoff. How many heard of Bernie Madoff? 
He made off with everybody's money. He was kind of the latter-day Ponzi guy, but his lasted 20 years. But he took some of the most famous movie stars and athletes and everything else, all their money. He took, and he didn't take thousands, he took millions and hundreds of millions from some people. He took the money. But folks, there's liars that'll take you down. No single issue is more prevalent in the ministry of Jesus Christ than that of his attack upon the traditions of the elders. Let's go to Mark chapter 7, if you would. Jesus confronted no group of people more than the elders, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. There was no group of people that lied, deceived, and tricked the people more than the, these groups. In Mark chapter 7 and verse 13, he says, um, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. He was dealing with the problem of these guys. He, he even called them the year of your father, the devil. Why? Because they were liars. They were liars, and they twisted the truth. They rested the scriptures. They, they twisted the word of God. And, you know, the great lie is one that takes the word of God and twists it. That's, even, that's the greatest liar of all. You know, the, he said in the last days, uh, they'll call good evil and evil good. It'll be that way. And, and there are lies like that. But I think the greater lies are that which take a bit of scripture and twist it 90 degrees. Make it say what it doesn't say. You know, nobody likes to be misquoted. Nobody likes their words twisted. And the one person who doesn't like it done is God Almighty. So we must be careful to study the scriptures and, and learn them and let them be true. I was going to preach a passage tonight, and pastor, I, I told Pastor I was going to preach on a message. But as I studied the passage, this very thing, this is why I'm preaching this tonight rather than that. I was going to preach on 2 Chronicles 7.14. I heard it preached, especially it seems like in about 1976 in America, is 200 years. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sins, and will heal their lands. Hey, hey that's a great message. And, you know, God can change this country if we'll do that. But you know what? I was going to say, I, I can preach that, and that will really... Uh, help people see that the problem in Australia is God's people, not their people. But you know what? Who the God's people were there were the nation of Israel. That was not dealing. Now, I could apply it that way, that if we'll follow the Lord, he'll bless the country. But that was a passage directly to the nation of Israel. And I just felt like, am I resting the scripture just a little bit to make a good message? And God got me under conviction about that. And I said, yeah, and I've heard many preachers, and I'm not condemning them, but I didn't feel comfortable. that Now, I can tell you the truth about it and say, okay, well, we can apply it that way, and I'd be honest with it, and I could have done it that way. But I realized, you know what, it's so easy to take just a little bit of something in the Bible and twist it because it makes you what you want to say. It's a good illustration of what you want to say. But it's not the truth. The truth is what God says. And in that case, King Solomon had dedicated the temple, and they were working there, and God was going to bless them and bless that nation, and that was God's promise to the nation of Israel. Now, I believe he'll do that for us too. But, you know, it isn't an application directly for us. That was a promise given to those people at that time. In our lives, we need to take and say, God, you show me what you want. You let me see. Folks, we got to be careful. The traditions of men 
are one of the most dangerous things around. It was dangerous in Jesus' day, and it's dangerous in our day. Folks will take the scriptures even and rest things. They'll try to say, you know what? We live in a contemporary, and you're not going to reach the, the city here if, if you stay with those old hymns. You're not going to stay there if, if you don't dress down a little bit. You know, you need to get your thongs on and have a little stool and get rid of that old-fashioned pulpit and, you know, and water it down a little bit and hey, preach a new version. They, they don't understand that King James. It's just too hard to understand. And you need to put on a, a singlet and, and everything and not dress in one of those ties and preacher and everything like that. You get that, and, and you need to be a little bit more hip. And if you talk like that and you, and you tell a lot of good stories, that, that'll get the people. But don't get too harsh because people will run away if you preach sin and preach things that are wrong. That sound familiar? That's what the world's trying to tell you. Let's see, what does God say? <laughs> Folks, I don't even have to quote a verse, and you know what God says. Modest in apparel. That sin is evil. To be repented of. To be turned from. Not to be compromised with. Not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. God, I, I'm tired of people trying to tell me that, oh, well, it's okay, you know, this and that, and they want to compromise on so many issues. Folks, drinking, smoking, swearing, chewing, womanizing, uh, watching pornography, it's still wrong. It's still wrong today. It hasn't changed. Just because somebody's out there saying, yea, hath God said? Yeah, there was a guy that said that a long time ago, and he's still saying it. And he's still saying, he, does, he, does, he wants you to compromise. And what he's not only doing that, but he's saying that you can't do it. There's a famous preacher in America named Harold Seitler. Uh, he was, when you were at Bob Jones, he was from Greenville, South Carolina. He was the opposite of Bob Jones across town. A uh, little bit wild around the church. I mean, they, they were a shouting, running church. And if you understand the south of America, that was common. They'd run the aisles and shout. And he preached one message one time, but it was mo his most famous. It, it was, can God provide a table in the wilderness? And he said, and God can. God can. See, the world's telling you God can't. But my friend, tonight I want to tell you that God can do whatever God wants to do if we'll be obedient to him and not listen to the lies of the devil and follow him. But the world's going to tell you, you can't do that and build a church. You can't do that and reach people. You can't do that and see people saved. You can't do that. Folks, you say, well, we're not real big here, but little is much when God is in it. Amen. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. God used the little things. He used the Gideons of this world in his 300. He used a, a man and his sons to build an ark. Folks, God doesn't need a lot. He just needs himself. And a usable vessel that God can pick up and deliver. Little is much. You... Can't, but God can. You can't afford to listen to the wiles of the devil. How are we to walk? Look in verse 5 and 6 there in Colossians chapter 2 again. How are we to walk? Uh, the Bible tells us there that he says you're supposed to walk in your Christian life the same way as you came to Christ. And that's by faith. What did you do when you got saved? You repented of your sin, right? Yes. Amen. Okay. And you received him by faith that what he did on the cross was the payment for your sin. So you turned from sin and obeyed him by faith. You trusted him. You know, the world's going to lie to you. You better get the word of God out so you know what's true. And then start trusting him by faith and walking by faith. God, not man, most um, uh, most calls, uh, most cults, excuse me, have a tradition. 
promising of things, and especially they're into prophecy. And, you know, you take the JWs and Seventh Days and a lot of these. You know what? They told us that Jesus was coming. All those groups told us that Jesus was coming. But if you'd studied God's word, you know that no man knew the day or the hour. But they told everybody they did. Now, what was the first sign for you to think that they may not be of God? That they're a liar, all right? They're a liar. God says this, and they said this. You know, hey, it's pretty simple. You don't have to have a lot of things. Now, there's some things we don't understand. There's some things that maybe uh, we can see differently in the scriptures. But there's some things that are pretty plain and true. No man knoweth the day or the hour. This is the day and the hour. Well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, black is white and white is black. When you start doing that, you know, it's kind of one thing. It's, you know, some little things that, you know, hey, well, I think we ought to get along with as many people as we can. But folks, when they're denying and calling God a liar, I've got a problem. There was a guy that wrote a book. Some of you, some of you most of you are young Christians, only us old guys that remember this. There's a guy who wrote a book that 88 reasons why Jesus Christ is coming back in 1988. You remember that one? Yeah, he had to come back in 1988. And then he did a revised edition of it when he's coming back in 89. <laughs> hey, man, hey, 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 kind of, folks, figure it out. Figure it out. The devil's a liar, and he's going to keep lying to you all the time. And you need to know your Bibles, or you will fall into the lies of the devil, okay? Ignoring God's word is a great risk. But adding to God's word is even a greater one. Ask the Mormons. They, they do that, okay? See, you're picking on people. Yep, I sure am. Okay, uh, but they add to it. I'll keep on. Verse 7 there. How do we to do it? Well, you've got to be rooted in Jesus Christ. You've got to dig something down. One thing, you know, it says grow in grace. Well, how do you grow in grace? You grow your roots into Jesus Christ. That's how you grow. You get something. Where does a plant get its nutrients? From its roots, from the soil. Are you rooted in Jesus Christ and his word? Are you growing in him? You, you think, well, I'm, I'm a new Christian. I, I just don't understand all that. Well, you know when a young plant starts to grow? What does it do? It sends down the tiniest little hairs of roots. Now, pastor's been around a while. He's got some big roots buried, just like the big trees do, play out by some Morton figs, you know, and those great big roots they've got go way down there and way out there. And, you know, you say, well, man, how does he get this stuff that he preaches? He, he's got some deep roots. But you know how you start getting those deep roots? You send down these little tiny ones. A plant sends these little tiny ones down. It starts getting in. And you know what? It gets down there and it finds something. And it finds some moisture and it finds some nutrients. It starts growing and then it starts digging deeper and digging deeper and digging deeper. Uh, as we grew up, we had, it was before the days of all the herbicides and stuff. We had, we grew soybeans. And soybeans are notorious for having a thing in, I don't even know if we have them here. Uh, you know what a cockleburr is? You know what a, a bendy is? It's a bendy that's that big. <laughs> and they grow up into plants. And the soybeans are about this high. But cockleburs can get this high. Now, if you have to pull one of those puppies out of the ground, you almost need a tractor. They are that hard to pull out. So the key is, is dad would get us out there, and we would walk the soybean fields and, by hand, pull every one of those cockleburs. Now, if you got out early, you could use a hoe. But you had to make sure that when you dug them, you dug them roots and all. Why? Because when the devil digs a root in, the only way to get rid of that is to dig it out by the roots and get it out. But you, we, we couldn't just break them off. In the temptation of course, when you're 10, 12 years old, is when dad's not looking, is just to break it off. But within two weeks, it would be this big again. You'd have to pull it. You have to pull it. You're going to have to pull some of the cockleburs out. 
Because let me tell you this. If you're growing in Christ, the devil's going to put some tears amongst your life. He's going to put some things in your life that you're going to have to get rid of. You're going to have to tear some things out of your life. And I don't know what it is in your life, but you need to tear it out. You, you can't play around with it. You can't break it off so no one sees it. Even if the preacher doesn't see it, even if your wife doesn't see it, even if mom and dad don't see it, it's still there. It's still there. You have to pull it out by the root. You have to lift it out. How to spoil your heart? Well, he gives four things here. I'll give these four things and I'll close. First of all, he says, they're going to spoil you through philosophy. Well, they'll use the intelligence. The love of knowledge is what philosophy means. They're going to be smart, highly intelligent, professing themselves to be as they become fools. Does that ring a bell? The philosophy of this world, the world is uh, just man's theology that tries to abandon God. God is true, every man's a liar. Remember that. And the world is trying to substitute the Bible with philosophy. A love of knowledge, also called Gnosticism. Lots of things like that. It's going to use psychiatry. Psychiatry is the pastor's job without God. It, now, folks, some of you, you may be just studying psychology. Be careful. Be careful. If you don't get the Bible as the basis of your how man thinks and what he does, the world will lead you down a path. <laughs> you know what the two highest suicide rates in the world are? Dentist and psychologist. They don't have the answer. They don't have the answer because they're trying to answer man without the manual, without God. They're without God. So they're, but they're going to use philosophy. They're going to profess to know what things are. There's a guy in New York. He's the head of the, um, what thing where you have telescopes? Um, Observatory in New York, New York Observatory. And they asked him, um, how much do we know of what's out there? Well, we're, there's dark matter, and that composes 98% of the universe. And we're not sure what it is. So let me tell you this. So you're trying to tell me you understand all of the universe but you don't even know what 98% of it is. And you're trying to tell me. And, and they say, oh, yes, I, I saw this thing. Here's a picture taken from the Hubble telescope and everything. You realize these are electron, they're uh, radio telescopes that they're using. You know what a radio telescope does? It sends back radio signals. It's not a camera. These big telescopes are not Optical telescopes are radio telescopes. And what they do is they have, they send back signals and they get these uh, frequencies coming back, like if radar, you know, radar bounces back, comes back forth. That's basically what it is. And what they say is, okay, now sit down and they have an artist draw it up. All these pictures of supernovas with all these dazzling colors and all this. They made it up. They have no idea what it looks like. They have no idea. They have an electrical signal that they've got an artist doing it. Folks, these people are lying to you. They, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're doing. But folks, just because a guy has a white lab coat on and he has a degree on the wall doesn't mean he knows, knows anything. He's just doing what other men have told him. That's all he's doing. But you know, you've got a book in your hand that will tell you the truth. If they tell you tomorrow that man is made of sand, you say, well, God said from the dust of the earth that he made man, so that makes a little bit of sense. 
But see, you've you got to come back to what the Bible says. Oh, see, it, folks, we got to go back to the Bible. The Bible will clue you in, and it'll tell you whether they're wrong or not. But they're saying one thing, and God's saying another. You know who's right and who's wrong. I don't care how many degrees they have behind and what university they went to. God is true, and every man's a liar. To philosophy, vain deceit. Being the deceit is the result um, of no Holy Spirit within. Vain, empty deceit, empty lies, empty lies. Folks, they will lie to you just so you will believe them. The world is out there telling you lies. There's preachers that will lie to you just so you believe them. That's how cults get started. That's how false doctrine gets started. It's vain deceit. Emptiness, lying just to get a following, lying just to get this. They seek to make you worse than themselves. And then the traditions of men. Just because they tell you there's an Easter bunny, don't believe it. Just because they tell you there's Satan Claus, Santa Claus, don't believe it. Just because they tell you infant baptism is okay, don't believe it. Just because they teach you to take the weekly Holy Eucharist, don't take it. Folks, come out from among them and be separate. The traditions of men, not only out there, they're in here. We must always be careful. Careful to search the scriptures, to know what they say. Our churches are filled with traditions. Be careful. It's not wrong to have a tradition, but you've got to know what is tradition and what is God. Yeah. Hey, our tradition is we come here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And we stand up, we have a preacher get up and talk, and do that. That's okay. But if one time you come in here and, the, and we have pastor standing down at that end, and the church is all switched around, some of you will panic. That doesn't matter, folks. What matters is God's word. What matters is what we're standing on, standing on the word of God. The end of, uh, never justifies the means. We say, well, if we do this, it'll be okay. No, it isn't. The rudiments of the world. What are the rudiments of the world? Well, let me give you a few rudiments as we close tonight. Well, the rudiments are the fundamentals, the foundations of the world. Well, first of all, one of the first ones is hedonism, or do what thou wilt. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. Do what you wilt. But what does the Bible tell us? It's the love of Christ constrains me. Why don't I fulfill the lust of my flesh? Because I love him because he, we love him because he first loved us. And the love of Christ constrains me to obey him and do what is right. Evolution, creation. That's the fundamental. Folks, they need evolution because it gives an answer to them, which isn't an answer at all, to having a world without God. And I got news for them. There is a world, and it's with God. God is the creator of the universe. The love of money. But the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. But they love the world, and they'll do anything for it. They'll do anything for it. The lust for power. And Jesus said, the chief of you will be a servant. And then probably the one that we're most in danger of is love yourself. You need to have self-esteem. And Jesus told to love others as you love yourself. It's others, not you. It's others. It's giving yourself to others. What about you tonight? Is it time to loosen yourselves from the bonds and the shackles of this world? The world is filled with a liar's philosophy. It wants to deceive you and take you down a road that you need not go. First Colossians chapter 3. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. 
Tonight, I challenge you to believe God. I have come to the point in my life where if the world says it, I don't believe it. Uh, my, first, my default position is they're lying. <laughs> and <laughs> then I might have to be convinced that they're true. But if the world is telling me something, I know who their father is. I know what they're trying to do. He is the deceiver. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life are all trying to take me away from my Savior. Let's believe God. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let's believe him tonight, Pastor.